Okay, welcome to the second half of 12.1. Uh, what we're going to do today now is uh, talk about the pressure. We've already talked about <clears throat> some properties of gases, but this is probably one of the main uh, topics of, of gases that we really focus on, and that is the fact that uh, gas has pressure. Okay, And you need to understand where that pressure is coming from. If you can imagine... Um, molecules. Let's look at this container down here. Now let's just pretend I've got just billions upon billions of gas molecules in here, okay? And they're all bouncing around in every single direction, okay? Those particles, even though they're very, very teeny, because there's billions upon billions upon billions of them there, because of that, um, they are creating a pressure on the wall of the container. And that pressure, if we hook it up to a pressure gauge, we can measure in one of the many units that we have. Now, you're used to having some kind of pressure on you at all times, and that's called our atmospheric pressure. Okay? And if you think about what's above you, you have miles and miles of air pushing on you, and that's kind of what this diagram is showing. So you've got all this air pushing in every single direction, and it is actually um, a significant amount. But we're used to it. We grew up with it. Um, it doesn't really bother us. However, when we go up into the mountains, we notice that the pressure is less. And so we have to pop our ears, so to speak. And we do that by yawning or chewing gum or something like that. And if you think about a road and then you've got a mountain, okay, and you're going up the road, okay, how much air do we have above us? Okay. As you get higher, there's less air, so the pressure decreases. You have these tubes in your ears, and they have air, air entra trapped inside. So as you go up, uh, the pressure lessens, which causes the volume of the air in your ear to get bigger, and so you, that causes an uncomfortable sen sensation, and that causes you to want to pop uh, your ears. So that's what the second bowl is. As you move closer to the earth, you get... Uh, the air gets denser, and all that is is because we have more air pushing on us down here than we would at somewhere high. Now, I've got this diagram that kind of shows the effects of pressure, and I did the exact same thing, and if you look in my room, I've got this bottle. Um, but I took a bottle. I was at Mount Rainier at Paradise, and I opened it up um, and then screwed on the lid. As I drove back down to Tacoma... In the back of my car, I could hear this squishing sound, and that was happening. And then eventually, down here at sea level at Tacoma, the bottle looks like this. Haven't done anything to it. It's just the pressure down here is greater than it is up at Mount Rainier, up in Paradise. And if I were to take this bottle and drive back up the mountain, it would go right back to this point and look like that. All right. So there we have it. We're dealing with pressure. All right. And... Um, the, the, the thing about pressure that's going to drive you nuts, or at least it drives me nuts, is when we want to start dealing with the amounts of pressure because we have all these units. Um, and here's just a couple up here. If we look at how we measure pressure, the first thing that, that uh, was developed to measure pressure was this barometer right here. Okay? And I believe it was invented by Torricelli. And what he did is he had this nice little pool here of mercury, all right, and put mercury in a tube, turned it upside down, and the mercury level went to a mark right here, okay? At um, sea level, that is 760 millimeters of mercury high, okay? And the reason this is up a certain height is, as you can see from the diagram, the air is pushing down, causes us to go up. So, as the days went by, uh, Torricelli noticed the, the mercury level went up or down. And that is in direct relation to the atmospheric pressure pushing down. If there's less pressure pushing down here, this would go down. If there's greater push, pressure pushing down here, that's going to go up. You will, uh, If you watch the weatherman, they talk about the pressure. A high pressure system means it's going to get clear. A low pressure system means we're going to have clouds. And it turns out that... Um, I can't really remember the units they often use, but it seems like they use typically use millimeters of mercury. All right. All right, so let's look at some of these other things about pressure. 
Here's, here's kind of a definition. It's the force divided by the area. Those of you moving on to physics next year, you will deal with that a lot. The official chemistry unit is the Pascal. However, it is a giant number. Look at, look at this conversion here. One atmosphere, which happens to be the pressure at sea level, uh, is 101,325 pascals. It's a very unusual number. It's also very large. So often we use kilopascals, which is just this number divided by 1,000, right? Um, but as far as units go, there's just there's bunches and bunches of them. There's uh, tors in honor of torcelli, and it turns out that one tor equals one millimeter mercury. Uh, there's atmospheres, which I tend to like. One atmosphere at sea level uh, equals 760 millimeters of tor. And these are just some conversion factors that you need to get in your journal because you're going to use them over and over and over. Some others that uh, we have is bar. And in America, we have pounds per square inch, PSI. And uh, we're not going to really use any of these. But your book does have... Uh, a table that shows you what the conversions are for those. Okay, And then the last thing I want to point out is this thing right here. This thing called standard temperature and pressure. Okay? You need to commit this to memory, write it in your journal. Standard temperature and pressure is 0 degrees Celsius, 1 atmosphere. And you're going to see that pop up a lot. All right. So what I want to do is I want to just take a moment to do a couple conversions just to make sure we're on track. The great news is this is no different than converting feet to inches. So let's say, for example, I have uh, 1.29 atmospheres, and I want to figure out how many millimeters of mercury. Okay. Well, just like we always convert, that whatever unit is there has to be on the bottom. So one atmosphere is right there, and 760 millimeters of mercury is right there and that answer is let's see sorry about this I didn't and that gives us 900 900 and oops nine oops let me just erase that's not good enough that gives me 980 millimeters of mercury okay so there you go. All right, that's a conversion. Let's try another one. Let's say we I want I've got uh, oh how about 851 millimeters of mercury, and we want to convert that to kPa. Okay. So again, cancel out my units. I know that 760 millimeters of mercury equals 1 ATM, 1 ATM, and this is atmospheres, not atoms, 101,325 pascals, okay, and then I'm just going to go over here, sorry about this, uh, and then uh, 1,000 pascals is 1 kPa. Right. Okay, and so when I work that out, I get 113 kilopascals. Okay, so there you go. Conversions just like we've been doing. Nothing new for you. Make sure the units cancel, cross canceling, stuff like that. Um, the ones, the units we're going to use the most uh, are probably KPA and ATM, but you just got to be aware for any of it. Okay, on to the last slide, KM theory. All right, <clears throat> now in order to make it a little easier for us to understand how gases work, uh, this theory has developed. And if you think about what the words mean, kinetic means moving, and then molecular, okay, molecules. So this is the uh, the theory of moving molecules. Okay, and for us, it's going to pertain to uh, gases. So let's just look at some of these things. And by the way, most of them you'll notice are things that you already intuitively know, or you've seen somewhere else. Um, and so, it should be pretty easy to, for you to see. Um, the first one, gas particles are in constant rapid motion and exert pressures on the walls of their container. Okay? If you were to look at a balloon, 
Okay, the reason the balloon is is there is because all those particles are bouncing all over the place, holding up the balloon. Okay, so all particles are bouncing off the walls. Gas particles are very far apart relative to their size and thus have zero volume. We pretend, for ease of use, that gas particles are simply just these points. Okay, they have no volume. We know that that's not true, and if you get into higher levels of chemistry, you get to actually uh, use the volume constant to help calculate it out. But in our minds, gas particles, because they're so far apart and they're so small, we just think of them as points. Okay? The next thing, gas particles have no attractive or repulsive forces between them. All right, so we're, we're uh, again, this is for ease of, of understanding and ease of calculations. We pretend that if there's a gas particle here and there's a gas particle there, there's no attractive forces or repulsive forces. All right, not necessarily true in real life, but for our calculations, it's okay. Gas particles collide, and their collision is perfectly elastic, no loss of energy. What in the world does that mean? Well, imagine a pool table, right? You've got a pool table, and you hit a billiard ball, right? Now here's here's the one ball. Uh, here's another ball, okay? And I I hit it. Now you guys know that when I hit it. Maybe the, the blue ball will go this way, the red ball will go this way, one will speed up, one will slow down. Well, for KM theory, the assumption we make is that when gas particles bump into each other, nothing is really happening. Okay? They're not going to slow down, they're not going to speed up, um, there's no loss of energy. And then the very last one, and this one that is super important, is gas particles have an average kinetic energy that's directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. What that means is it, depending on how hot it is, directly affects how uh, much energy is moving. So look at this box right here. Here's these particles bouncing around, right? What we're saying here with this with step five is it doesn't matter what gas you have in there. It doesn't matter how big it is, how small it is, how heavy it is. On average, gases at 100 degrees Celsius are all going to have the same kinetic energy, right? If I have another gas in a different container at 150 degrees, oops, I should put Kelvin, my fault. Um, let's see, let me do this one more time. Let's get some numbers that are more realistic. How about 300K versus one that's at 400K? Okay, This gas right here, doesn't matter what it is, is going to be, on average, moving faster. Now, we know that some of these will be slower, some of these are faster, but on average, uh, the kinetic energy is directly related to the Kelvin temperature. Super, super important concepts going to pop up all the time. Okay, Now, there's a couple things that, uh, if you want to kind of supplement this... Uh, this podcast, you you can do that. If you want to look any kind of uh, kinetic energy on YouTube, they've got little clips there. Um, if you want to see pressure in action in a real life situation, uh, go to YouTube up here and do the Augustus A G U S T Augustus Gloop. Okay. Augustus Gloop from uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and you will see what pressure does to him. And also, hopefully, uh, my my Can Crush, oops, my Can Crush podcast or demo uh, will will show up in this in this little podcast. If not, go to my demo page, okay, and you'll see me crush a can with just the atmospheric pressure. Okay? So with that, I hope everything works out. If there's any of this stuff that doesn't make sense, again, come see me, read your textbook, look at the notes on lines, uh, but get that stuff in your brain.